When the First World War broke out in 1914, the German army had 6,000 trained dogs. The British had one, an Airedale Terrier. In fact, Britain was alone amongst the great powers in not having a military dogs program. But now, as you can see, things have changed a little, haven't they, Marley? Today, Britain leads the way. At the Defence Animal Centre in Melton Mowbray, I'm about to see some of the most sophisticated training techniques in the world for the deployment of military dogs and their handlers. Just check out Stigan searching for a tiny piece of explosive material. This dog is trained to focus, really focus. You could land a helicopter next to him and he wouldn't budge. That's impressive. This is what the military call HASDIA, High Assurance Search Dog. It's trained to spot any kind of a peculiarity on the ground that might be a threat. And he's now going to stay there staring at that no matter what I say. Yo! Do you want a sausage? Let's go! Walkies! Meet Sparky and Onyx. You know, it's weird that Britain was so far behind the game when it came to dogs in World War I, especially given our reputation as a nation of dog lovers. Maybe that was the problem. Maybe we loved them too much. The reason things changed was largely down to the vision of one man, Lieutenant Colonel E.H. Richardson. He was convinced of the contribution dogs could make in combat and lobbied the military top brass to take the idea seriously. And while they deliberated, warring nations such as Italy were using dogs to carry munitions across treacherous alpine terrain. Richardson was sure that dogs could solve the communications problem on the Western Front, where phone lines were often down and runners were easy targets. Finally, on the 31st of December, 1916, two dogs trained by Richardson were sent to run messengers on the Western Front. Their success in navigating across shell holes and muddy fields led to a request to set up the British War Dog School to provide more canine support. The modern British military dog was born. The training program was led by Mrs. Richardson, and lasted around five weeks before the animals were sent for duty. Today, dogs like Quinn are trained for around 12 months until they're ready for action. The advent of modern communications meant that dogs as messengers sort of became obsolete, but there was still one key military task that dogs could perform, and that was search. Today, the forces have to search planes, vehicles, uh, houses, and what this exercise here is doing is deploying that canine strength, a sense of smell. Quinn is trained to filter out competing and confusing scents so he can home in on the most important. What's in there? A target scent that we wanted him to find, which is uh, explosives. Over the years, the military has fine-tuned exactly what it wants from its dogs. It comes down to two broad areas. There's the search and detection work, and then there's protection. Throughout history, armies have sought to take advantage of the aggression and muscle power of certain breeds of dog. Got it. The Romans, for example, trained up dogs take on swordsmen. Today, there's few patrols out there that don't value having a dog like this with them. Believe me, getting a dog, even one that's been put through some of the best training in the world, to follow commands is never simple. Back in World War I, because dog handling was in its infancy, the British soldiers were basically making it up as they went along. Today, of course, that's completely different. It's a fine art and the training for guys like Mikey, dog handlers, is as comprehensive and intensive as it is for the dogs. But do you reckon I can give it a go, Mikey? It's easy as shelling peas. Right. There's your dog. Thank you. So I'm sending it off to a target somewhere in this field. I know where the target is. The dog Onyx doesn't. At the moment, it's facing the wrong way. Onyx, go on this way. Right, back. <laughs> Not going where I want it to go. Sit! I'm not sure I'm cut out for this. 
Okay, Mikey. Yeah. You tell the dog where to go. Go on then, let's see how it's done. Honey. Yep, exactly where I want it to go. Back in World War I, as the use of dogs developed and they proved their worth on the battlefields, so did the level of care for their well-being, with kennels being provided behind the front line. The relationship between handler and dog is as vital now as it was in World War I. And while the specialist role of military dogs has developed hugely since they were introduced in World War I, some elements have remained unchanged. One of those is morale. Soldiers love having a dog in the ranks. Well, hello there. My name's Charlie Bloom, and this is my great friend Trezor. I talk, and he listens. Now, Trezor, did you know that it wasn't just the wonderful horse who played a role in World War I? Oh, no, there were other animals who lent a hand, like slugs, elephants, <coughs> seagulls, <coughs> pigeons, sea lions, <coughs> and glowworms. Welcome to the weird and wonderful animals of World War I. <laughs> now, when the Americans joined the war, they searched high and low for a creature to detect oncoming mustard gas. Cows, cats, rats, mice, guinea pigs, flies, and even fleas were all tested to no avail. Enter the common garden slug. The sensational slugs were able to detect the presence of mustard gas due to their sensitive snozzles. The slugs would show signs of distress, thus allowing the soldiers to put on their masks before being exposed to lethal levels of gas. And from the fantastic slug to a flatulent seagull. Who? So desperate were the Allies to counter the menace of the U-boat that they tried to train seagulls to defecate on U-boat periscopes. Didn't work. Of course it didn't work. You'd have more luck getting a sea lion to spot a U-boat, which is exactly what they tried next. Yes, sea lions would dive down into the deep and on spotting a boat underwater, surface thus revealing its location. <laughs> Genius! Another birdie conscripted by the Allied forces was the carrier pigeon employed to relay messages and take surveillance. In response, the Germans would send up inceptor hawks. Didn't stop this little birdie, though. This is Cherami, who saved 194 lives after her battalion became trapped behind enemy lines. She delivered a message detailing their location despite having been shot, blinded in one eye, and with a leg hanging on only by a tendon. What a legend! Now, let's not forget that just under a million horses were sent off to the front not only as part of the cavalry, but also to perform such tasks as pulling artillery, ambulance trolleys and supply wagons. <laughs> These acts were recently acknowledged by the best play, book and film ever made, War Horse. <laughs> Which I had a small part in, Trezor. Yes, I did. But Spielberg could have made his film about the heroic glowworm. Yes, the British soldiers in the trenches found unlikely allies in these bioluminescent critters, using them to illuminate battle plans and letters from loved ones. Wormworks Pictures presents... What is it? It's a worm. A worm they found wandering about in no man's land. What kind of worm? A miraculous worm would be my guess. A special friendship. They say he only glows for those with a soldier's heart. Really? No. Dear Arthur, it was lovely to receive your last letter. I'm glad you have a new friend. Sometimes the greatest friendships are forged in the most testing of times. We shall fight and be victorious, whatever the cost. You'll be torn to pieces. It's just a worm for Christ's sake. Arthur! Far from home. Can you see? 
Nein, da ist niemand. Los! Halt! Da drüben. The light still shines. Was ist das? Die Engländer nennen das ein Glowworm. Aber das ist doch ein Käfer. Wie heißt es bei uns? Glukäfer. Englische Dummköpfe. Ähm, wir sagen dazu auch Glühwürmchen. Glühwürmchen. This summer in Cinemars. War World. <laughs> It's Trezor. I expect it would get some glowing reviews. And finally, with so many horses off to the front, farmers and traders in some parts of the country look to more exotic animals to undertake their tasks. Yes, our last animal is the exotic elephant. And this is Lizzie, a travelling circus elephant who was enlisted to haul scrap metal from merchants and became a regular sight down the cobbled streets of Sheffield. She's even had a bus named after her. That's it from us. It's goodbye from me. And Trezor would say goodbye if he could talk. <laughs>